95% of Uber Eats orders are on time, which is great. Because the only thing I care about more than football is spicy pepperoni pizza for kickoff. But on the off chance your order is late, Uber Eats will give you three months $0 delivery fee with a free Uber One membership. Now that's a spicy offer. On time claim based on latest arrival time shown after order is placed. Offer ends to 19 2023. Current Uber One members not eligible. Subscription will auto renew at nine ninety nine each month starting three months from initial enrollment. See uber.com slash Uber One for terms. Benefits available only for eligible stores. Order minimum supply. Hello and welcome to the 1865 Match Report with me, Rich Ferraro, on the day that Nottingham Forest got what feels like a big win against Leicester City, uh, which has left the table feeling quite good. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So I'm joined by Baz and before we speak to him, let's have a look at the team news. And basically there was just one change for the Reds starting lineup. So they had Dean Henderson in goal, Serge Aurier, Joe Worrell, Scott McKenna in for Willy Bolly in the back four, and then Renan Lodi at left back. We had Freuler flanked by Yates and Mangala in midfield. And then up front, we had Scarpa playing as the number 10 with Gibbs White and Johnson up front. And again, something to talk about a little bit later. Um, before we go any further, Baz, that feels like a big one today, doesn't it? Yeah, um... I think I said in the the last match report that we've got Leicester today, we've got Bournemouth away, we've got Leeds coming up, and all three when like until today, we were like within one point of all three of those teams. So yeah, and two of those being home games, it's it, this is a big big month for us. Um, and also symbolically, being I, I mean I can't speak for for everyone, but I would say that for me. The Leicester away match felt like probably the lowest point this season. It felt like there was yes, no hope for Forrest then. Was, it was absolutely hot. And actually, um, I'm sure we'll come to this later as well. But Steve Cooper said after the game, he said that he handed out a... Uh, they showed a video of the support at Leicester when they were 4 nil down. And he said, personally, this was really, really important to me to, to repay some of that support. So I think... That we we keep saying he's either the best actor in the world or or, or he genuinely loves us. I think that that moment touched him as well. I mean, um, Colin Frey has said on a couple of occasions, um, and and you can hear it in his voice. But he says that when he's there interviewing Steve Cooper in those moments, it's like he, he he can feel Steve Cooper kind of staring into the distance, like getting a little bit glassy eyed, and. Um, yeah, and, and, and he did that again in the post-match interview mm-hmm. today where he was saying that was for the fans because they supported us so much at 4-0 down in, in the away match, which, you know, still remains probably his lowest point as Forest manager. He was he was really angry, which is pretty mm. rare from him. Um, let's talk about the match and let's just um, say that... <sighs> so in the first half, Yates, he had a header after just a few minutes and... It was, um, you know, it, by the sounds of it, I wasn't there, but by the sounds of it, he probably should have done better with that, yeah? Yeah, I mean, partly because it was Yates, he kind of like, you, you were kind of expecting it to go wide, but it went, it what it wasn't, it didn't trouble them in any way. Mm. And you'd imagine if it had been a proper, like, old-fashioned number nine, that would have been a goal. Yeah, yeah, OK. And then he also had um, an effort a few minutes later, which, again, didn't really trouble, trouble no, the goal. No, and it was, it was a, a bit of a tame shot and it wasn't, it wasn't on target. Yeah, speculative, shall we say. Yeah. OK. But the big chance in the first half actually fell to the visitors, didn't it, after about 15 minutes. And Harvey Barnes, who gave Nico Williams nightmares in the King Power... Mm-hmm. Um, well, he'll be having nightmares tonight, won't he? Yeah. Um, so, this is actually so. This is this does hark back to the the game, the away game earlier in the season. So for much, so we had a little spell for the first ten minutes or so where we kind of dominated play, but then Leicester came into it, and for much of the first half, it was very similar to that game at the King Power where our midfield and attack were quite a long distance apart and Leicester just filled that space and what happened was I can't remember it was it broke down the the right and Yates had gone up to the halfway line to track someone else and I don't know where Aurier was but Harvey Barnes was basically completely unmarked and had 
eight, the, the, there was a huge gap with just him in it, and yeah, he, he should have he should have at least got it on target. Yeah, and uh, Brian Laws on the radio was was critical of Aurier, saying, you know, he's done some great stuff since he's come to Forest, but um, he didn't track his man, and, and Worrell was was kind of ended up covering the covering Jamie Vardy, and then having to try and cover that space, and obviously it left a big gap. Mm. Um, one of the things that we did say in that match at King Power is that um, Barnes, you know what he's going to do, you know he's going to come in on his right foot, and um, that was his downfall on this effort, wasn't it? Because if he'd just gone with his weaker foot. Surely he would have. He would have scored. Well, yeah. Um, to, to be honest, it's it's not. Yeah, he he missed what is a, basically a sitter. But more worrying was the fact that he had the opportunity at all. It was it was our midfield and our defending that was at fault. Okay, right now, in terms of actual goal math action, is it fair to say that that was about it for the first time? In terms of quality in general, it it was a local derby. It was. Full of incident, but low on quality. Yeah, which is what you'd expect. And would you say it was a bit of a stalemate in reality in that first half? I would say, actually, Leicester deserved to win the first half. OK, because let's be honest, we had two teams on the same points total next to each other in the table, uh, but in the lower half of the table. Mm. So is that a fair reflection of, yeah, of yeah. what the match looked like? Um, just a bit of a footnote um, on the first half. Ryan Yates went down... Um, with a few minutes to go to half time, uh, he had some treatment and then he came back on. Doesn't sound like it's a big surprise that he didn't come out again for the second uh, half. Just to, to add to that as well, um, like Gustavo Scarpa, who was playing effectively in the number 10 role, one, he was incredibly frustrated because of this distance between the midfield and the attack. He was was not seeing the ball, and when he was seeing the ball, he was getting it in really bad position, so he couldn't do much with it. But then, a few minutes after Yates went down, he went down, clutching at his thigh. Yeah. And then when the final whistle, when the halftime whistle went, both him and Yates both sat down immediately. And so I was actually, I wasn't surprised that Yates didn't come back on, but I was also concerned about Scarpa. Mm. And that actually plays a very important part in the second half. Well, yeah, absolutely. So it's nil-nil at half time, And if we move on to the second half... One thing that was noticeable was that, uh, so Yates didn't come back out and was replaced by Colback. Um, I mean, like for like, it sounds, I mean, again, I'd say I didn't, I wasn't at the game. It sounds like Colback actually covered the right-hand side of my midfield yeah. with Mangala staying in his position in the left-hand channel. Um, and it sounds as though that may not just have been to avoid disturbing Mangala, but also to provide a little bit of support on the right-hand side against Barnes. Yeah, I mean, uh, there were there were moments, especially when, um, what's it, Morier went forwards, that Colback was ending up playing at right back. Yeah, it was, it was that kind of thing. Yeah, so that was one substitution during the break, and then usually we're used to seeing Cooper make substitutions on about sixty or sixty-five minutes. He played his hand a little earlier this time. Well, and actually, bef- I think it was before the substitution. Barnes had another go. He did. Yes, go tell us about that. Um, I can't remember. It was, it was, again, it was just Leicester again actually started the, the second half better and were again making the same sort of domineering the midfield kind of thing. Um, I think it was a through ball. I can't even remember. But it was um, something that once again Barnes pretty much had his pick of where to put the ball and he didn't get hit the target. Yeah. And um, it's one of those, it's a strange one really because. Forrest and Leicester equal on points, but you can tell when those kinds of moments that Forrest are the team who have a little bit of momentum, just mm. are in the ascendancy, and Leicester are on a bit of a downward spiral because... And if either of those had gone in, this game would have been very, very different. But just as importantly as from a Forrest perspective, it also seems as though that took the wind out of Leicester sails completely, which, again, something we'll come back to a little mm. bit later. Let's talk about chronologically the next important thing which was that Scarpa came off after 55 minutes yep. and was replaced by Sam Surridge um, and the bloke behind me said Scarpa's going off I'd take Johnson off and I had to turn around and say actually Scarpa was injured and he was he was limping when he went off at half time mm. but Surridge coming on changed our shape so Gibbs White took that number 10 role and Surridge was basically playing where a one year was playing sort of on the left wing yeah 
Um, and that is what made the difference. Having Gibbs White in there rather than Scarpa, who's obviously still adjusting to the English. This is the first time I've seen him play. He looked very frustrated because he wasn't getting the ball and he he, he he's, he's having that period of adjustment that, yeah. that everyone goes through. But Gibbs White knows what he's doing. He knows what, where, where everyone is. He and knows he's how confident. To pick, and he knows how to pick out a pass. Yeah. So talk us through the opening goal because it wasn't as simple as a pass through and then Johnson putting it away and then happy days, was it? <laughs> well, um, when... Uh, when the pass, um, this I've, I've mentioned this before, Gibbs White and Jono seem to be building this understanding. Uh, Gibbs White knows where to put the ball and Jono knows when to make his runs. It's just so far, they've been about half a yard off. When Gibbs White put the ball through for Jono this time, from where I was, Jono... It was like he, he had the, the full-back, I uh, can't remember what it was, uh, but... He had to get round the fullback, and I thought Luke Thomas. In, yeah, yeah. He, he, I thought Jono made the wrong choice because in going round the fullback, he put himself offside, mm-hmm. and he was. It looked to me like he was a good foot or so offside when Gibbs White played the ball, and then basically he took it past. And um, the, the Leicester defence was scared of Jono. Um, mm-hmm. that that's fair. To, all the way through the game, they didn't want the ball to get to him. They they knew that. Um, that he could outpace them, and the is it the the Dutch boots that face, yeah, with the, with the hair. Um, he made a number of very very good last ditch tackles um, throughout the entire game, but they were proper proper last ditch. It's like if you get it two inches wrong, then we would we would have scored, sort of thing. But because they were so scared of Jono, and it looked like he was offside. They they were static and therefore Jono just had to round the keeper and put it in the net. So then what happened? <laughs> well, the, the linesman obviously raised his flag, but I think most of the ground knew it was offside. Knew it was offside. Yeah, the the the, 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 the there were cheer, there was cheering, but it was like yeah, yeah. kind of cheering. So the, the, yeah, the radio commentary straight away they said, and Johnson gets the ball, he's in an offside position, and he goes around Ward and slots it home. And but they're expecting it to be, yeah, you know, and then yeah. Lansman flag, Lansman's flag goes off, goes up, and and Colin Frey actually said, "Well, VAR will look at that, but it's not going to get given, is it?" Yeah, and um, yeah, and it took a while, and yeah, and it was given on on side, and I I've not seen any images of it or whatever, but uh, I'm very very surprised that it was given. Well, apparently they did draw the lines across. I've not seen it either. Um, so it sounds like it was a trailing leg by Fass and it was marginal. But in those, I mean, yes, there are critics of the way they use VAR for offsides. Um, but the way they do it, they're attempting to make a binary decision of it's either offside or it's not. And so that's gone in our favour. Um, now, that sounds... Very important because first blood in these games is important. Like as you said, mm. if Barnes had scored either of his chances, it would have meant the match was quite different. From what I can gather, Forrest were pretty comfortable after that. Yeah, it's, it's so that that gap in midfield, because of Gibbs White in the centre, that became where we dominated. And although Leicester ploughed forwards and huffed and puffed a lot. They they did lack belief in what they were doing, mm-hmm. and we look, looked like. I don't think actually there were that many chances or where we looked like we were going to score, mm. but we looked dominant and yeah. we looked in con- more in control of the game as much as you can be in control of a game where the ball's pinging about all over the place. Yeah. And we'll talk about some of the key players um, a little bit later on. Um, just a couple of, of footnotes here. Um, Daniel Amati was booked. Yuri Tielemans had been booked in the first half. Seems as if he was a lucky boy to not get yes, second yellow. It was uh, so, so O'Brien came on for Mangala because um, Mangala doesn't seem to make it past seventy minutes, yeah. <laughs> and um, and yeah, he was like sort of running towards the left wing just outside the D, and team was just took him out. Yeah, took both his legs out, and, and it's, it's, it's one a of, it's, blatant yellow card. It's very clearly one of those things where if if. 
he hadn't already had a yellow card, the ref would have immediately reached for a yellow card. Yeah. They took pity on him. Um, and because it's only a yellow card decision, VAR's not going to intervene on that. Mm. Um, I mean, there was another moment, I think, was it for, was it for the, the Amati yellow card? Was it an incident involving Fass where there was some argument about whether it was in the box or outside or something like that? But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's one of those. when there was, those... A, there was a few around that time where the ref appeared to bottle it. That's a very good phrase, yeah. Okay. And the thing with that is that when you're a goal up against a team who are near you in the table, so it is a six-pointer, I found myself thinking that's a situation whereby if the ref is not necessarily being assertive and in control of the game, then that's the kind of thing where it can lead to you not getting the results. Yeah. And so just to skip ahead to the end of the match, that second goal was, I mean, it was just a massive relief. But also, it was frankly sexy, wasn't it? <laughs> it was It was brilliant. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone in the ground, could you could feel it. It was like, we need that second goal. Yeah. We really, really need it. And once again, it's that understanding between Morgan Gibbs-White and Jono. But... I want to rewind because this is one where I have seen a clip. So this actually started from Joe Worrell heading the ball out yes, on the edge of actually, his own six-yard box. Um, it actually, yeah, let's do, I'll just I'll mention this because McKenna came in for Willie Bolly, um, and especially in the first half, I, I actually put on the group chat. Uh, we're all over the place defensively, and what it was was you could tell that McKenna and Worrell hadn't played together yeah. this season because. They kept on running into each other. Mm. This bit for the, for this goal, Worrell almost like growled at McKenna and told him to get out of the way, and then did this massive, like really, really decisive header, mm -hmm. which which turned an um, defence into attack. So the ball comes out of the box. Ren and Loddy then. I was going to say he hoofs it. He he kind of puts his foot through it, but he deliberately doesn't just kick it into oblivion. You can tell that he just pulls back slightly as with his follow-through, so it's not just a, a full hoof down the line. Mm. And then Morgan Gibbs White, for absolutely no reason, but it makes me very excited, did an overhead kick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which then went on to Surridge. Yeah. Surridge then gives it back to Gibbs White, and all of a sudden Morgan has found that pocket space in the number yeah, 10 yeah. position... Curves the ball with the outside of his foot to Johnson, who's coming in from the right-hand side. Steve Cooper described it as a very Brennan Johnson goal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because yeah, because he was coming in from the right wing. Um, we saw it a few lots of times last season. Uh, coming in from the right wing, completely outpaced the fullback, and the finish is absolutely exquisite as well. The mm. way he just places it where he wants it. Yeah. Okay. And so that's two 0 Game over. Or so we thought. Okay, so Brennan then gets taken off straight away. Milks the applause. Nico Williams goes on, plays and plays and he's a fullback, so obviously he's playing right centre well, forward. Actually, yeah, I'd, I would have my. Um, <laughs> I was actually just talking to my dad in the car about uh, about Williams, and um, I don't think he is a fullback, but that's part of the point. I well, I think he will be a fullback, <laughs> but. Um, he's not going to get in the team ahead of Serge Aurier and because he and it's partly down to personnel isn't it we've got a mm. few players out injured so it makes sense to give Nico the minutes in a position where he can he's not under pressure mm. but he can do a good job get minutes and so on and so you think okay Forrest are going to try and see this out 86 minutes 2-0 up and then just when you think everything can be calm and groovy then Henderson goes down as if he's been shot in the leg. Well, this is... So this is the really... So he... I think he, he cleared a free kick or something, a, a goal kick. And we all look up the other end of the pitch. And then suddenly someone for, in, in the stands, I, I heard him sort of go, look at that. And you look over and Henderson's like lying flat in the goal mouth, well, just outside the goal mouth, but he's holding his head. Like he's got his ha head in his hands while he's lying flat on the mm. ground. And we're all like, they just chucked something at him. Mm -hmm. We genuinely thought that he'd been like hit by a coin or something like that. But 
when he stands up, he's holding his leg. Mm. And we're like, well, we, we, and we, I genuinely had no idea what was going on. Mm. But he could barely walk. I mean, and we'd had all our sub... Rather, we hadn't had all five subs, but it's... But we'd had all our substitution three, opportunities. Yeah, the, the three thing, yeah, we'd, things... Yeah, we'd made four substitutions. One of them was half-time, and we'd had three substitution windows. Yeah. So we couldn't bring on anyone else on. And and it was, what, like 90 minutes, 89th minute? It was minute? just as we were about on the cusp of full time. So with five five minutes of um, injury time, time yeah. yeah. Um, and there was one point where... You can, you know, he wasn't. He could, he could barely walk. There was one point where the ball came back to him, and he went to kick it with his right foot and couldn't, and just weakly knocked it out for a throw in with his left foot because mm. that was all he could do. Mm. Yeah. Now, going back to that thing that we're saying about a team on the ascendancy and a team who are spiralling a little bit, you'd have thought Leicester would have just basically stuck that fuss up front. And then hoofed it. Mm. They didn't do any of the, anything of the they, sort, they, did they? They, 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 they weakly surrendered. Yeah, they, they they didn't change anything about what they were doing. It was like, yeah, the match is over now. Mm. Okay. And the match was over. And after those five minutes of stoppage time, it ended 2-0 to Forest. The 1865 Match Report. Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello, I'm Brian McClare. I used to kick a football around for Celtic and Manchester United. McClare! Yeah! These days I'm joined by special guests to talk anything and everything on my podcast, Life with Brian. When you meet footballers, you just giddy out you. You kind of like, they've lived your dreams. Me and Bez are inseparable a lot of the time. So join me and listen to Life with Brian, the Brian McClare podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, Baz, let's talk about a few of the key things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, We've already talked a little bit about about Steve Cooper's comments after the game where he was very appreciative of the fans. He wanted to give this one back after the away match at Leicester, which was such a a dismal occasion. We've already talked about his comments about uh, it being a Brennan Johnson goal. Um, Let's start off with Brennan Johnson. Obviously, he's taken some criticism since the since the World Cup break for his decision making, and then he crossed that ball to Taiwo Awonyi, and everyone said, "Okay, he's got it right that time." And I said in that match report, um, "Well, what that shows is that with forwards, and we used to say it back in the day about Stan Collymore, he'd, he'd constantly be shooting, and sometimes he'd hit the top tier of the Bridgeford stand." Mm. But we're saying. We don't mind because as long as forwards are having a go and they're creating opportunities, if they keep having a go, then that's good because it means that eventually it'll come good. And it sounds to me as though today was that day for Brennan in terms of his opportunities and runs a goal. Well, actually, I thought it was interesting that the bloke behind me said uh, they're taking Scarper off, I'd take Johnson off because he is one of those players where it looks like he's not doing anything for, for large periods of the game. But that's all because his game's all about timing. Mm-hmm. And what was really good was once he got the timing right, and obviously this understanding with Gibbs White helps with that, but then he's he does have that confidence now to to use the ball correctly. And and actually part of that is lifting his head at the right moment, I'm yeah. guessing. So that's what he did with, with that pass for Taiwo at Southampton, and that's what he did with his goals today. It's about Having that, not just focusing upon the ball, looking up and seeing what your options are and getting your eye in. The other thing that um, occurred to me is that Danny Ward's his Wales teammate. And I'm just thinking, I wonder if that made a difference, especially Mm. with the first goal of saying, I'm going to go around him. Because that's not something we've seen Brennan do that often. Mm, Usually he he will have a shot from kind of 18 yards or, or, or 16 yards or whatever. But he went around Ward, who was coming out. And I'm just thinking if if he was going... I know what you what you yeah, yeah. what you can do and what you can't do, and I'm going to take play, take you on at this one. Um, so, do you think he'd have scored the second goal quite so confidently if that first goal had been ruled out for offside? Probably not, to be honest. Yeah. Um, okay. The other thing that I want to mention about Brennan is that he was the player put out for a post match interview on the radio, and he commented about 
yeah, me and Morgan, we know we know what we can do. <laughs> so he was talking about that growing relationship and both the Joe Worrell before the game and Brennan Johnson after the game. What I also thought was really interesting is that they were using that match at the King Power, you know, as a kind of a staging post in terms of saying, we know that we weren't good enough earlier in the season. We know we've had lots to learn. So it's quite interesting that players are talking about that while the season's still going. Mm. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that you, you might hear people reflect upon at the end of the season or something like that. Um, so again, that to me, that speaks volumes about the kind of the culture that Steve Cooper has amongst the players. Um, I want to move on. You've mentioned Scarper a few times. You mentioned that he looked frustrated. I don't think the plan was ever to play him three matches in a row, was it? Uh, probably not. And um, I'm not convinced that... Well, I, th- I think given the choice, I, I, I've read that he can play on the left. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would rather see Gibbs White playing in the centre and him on the left than if he can do that. OK, well, one thing that's worth noting is that we've now, for the first time in a little while, we've got a week off. So that rest and that time on the training ground might be helpful to Scarpa because Steve Cooper made a very pointed comment about we haven't had any training time. Mm. We've just been going from match to match. Also, the next match is against Bournemouth. So would you be at all surprised if Sam Surridge played in the as the left-hand centre forward and then Gibbs White was back at number 10? Yep, no, that, that makes sense. Especially against Surridge's former club. Mm-hmm. So, so that's just another option. And Scarpa... It's unfair to expect a player from the Brazilian league to play every match in the English English. Uh, he's, English already, he's had a full season already, hasn't he? So yeah. So, um, so that's another thing that's worth noting about. As we're talking Brazilians, let's talk about Ren and Lodi because it sounds like after a really difficult first part of the season, really feels like he's finding his feet now, doesn't it? I thought when I when I watched the Chelsea game. I can remember turning to the bloke next to me going, he's had a really good game. And he went, you know what, you're right. And he seems to, something seems to have clicked for him and he knows what he's doing in the English game at the moment. And he's on really good form. Yeah, yeah. And and not just, I mean, in the first part of the season when he was acclimatising, people were saying he's a defensive liability, but he could be quite good going forward. I think that's a bit of a reductive comment. People just say that about Brazilian fullbacks, mm-hmm. thinking they're bound to be good going forward. But he is. He's 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 doing both, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, defensively at the moment, he's doing really, really well. The the number of times one of their players would have like three yards on him, and you think, oh God, they're in space and they're gonna they're gonna get the cross in, and then he's back and they're just forced out to the corner flag. Yeah, and it was his positional sense that was letting him down in the mm. in his early games wasn't it and again maybe that's to do with the pace of the game or whatever but it sounds like he's really finding his feet whether that's helped by having Scarpa around as well now whether that's training and and, and having the world cup to work with the rest of the team and the training staff uh the coaching that staff at, that game at Stoke when the rest of the Brazil team were playing Cameroon <laughs> well that's the thing it, you know if you can do it on a in a winter <laughs> night in Stoke um so that's that's really promising, and of course, it's the worst kept secret. Um, Steve Cooper denied all knowledge of it, um, but Danilo's joining as well. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have a third Brazilian um, in the squad. Um, Can you just imagine Roy Keane's reaction every time we score? <laughs> um, interestingly, in Steve Cooper's interview, they said, "Oh, have you got anything to uh, uh, D- Danilo? Is, is there any news on that?" And he was like, "No, there's nothing to report." <laughs> so the man just can't, he 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 can't tell a bare faced lie. He was just like, no, there's nothing to report at the moment. Um, so uh, let's just mention um, what that does to um, Forest. Well, before that, go on. I would like to talk about the other fullback, uh, Serge Aurier. So we mentioned him with in relation to Harvey Barnes at the beginning, mm-hmm. but from about thirty minutes on, he was everywhere. Mm-hmm. He was out. I've never seen anything like it. He was defending everything. He was stopping every attack, and he was making every attack. He was turning defense into attack. There was even a point where he broke up the left wing and put a decent cross in with his left foot. I mean, it's a good job that Colback was able to cover right back then, <laughs> wasn't it? Uh, but yeah, I, I, I mean, we 
uh, he actually got the official man of, uh, player of the match mm -hmm. award. I can remember when the second goal went in, well, me and the bloke next to me, we were, we were like, it's Serge again, it's Serge again, he's done mm -hmm. it again, Serge, Serge, Serge. And then um, Brennan scores the second goal and went, Brennan's just taken Serge's man of the match <laughs> award. And and then he still got it. And mm -hmm. so I'm really pleased that, that whoever chooses the, the player of the match the noticed how good he was that game. Yeah, OK. Let's, let's... So, well, what's also encouraging is that actually, so you're talking about Brennan... Sky gave it to Morgan Gibbs White. The sponsors gave it to Serge Aurier. I mean, that's a good sign, isn't it? Mm. If there's a number of players who are who are doing such a good job, and that's a sign that it's not just about individual players; it's mm. about the team. Um, which is what Steve Cooper keeps talking about. I want to talk about the table. Um, the players and the manager all saying, "Look, we know that it feels good at the moment, but this is just the starting point. We need to keep this up. We've not achieved anything as yet." Forest are currently 13th in the table, 19 games played, 20 points. Um, Leicester are on 17, so we've we've leapfrogged them. And if we look down the table, the teams in the relegation zone currently are West Ham, Everton and Southampton. And they're on 15 points. So we've got a five point cushion and we no longer have the worst goal difference mm -hmm. in the division, um, which currently Bournemouth have that mantle. Um so that feels also quite important, doesn't it? Because that defensive record, which really let us down in the first part of the season, um, it's kind of good to, to get that monkey off our backs. Just a word here for my good lady wife, who looked at the table and said, it's quite nice not having to scroll down on my phone screen to see <laughs> Forrest's name in the table. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it, it feels good, doesn't it? And it shows that, firstly, it's there's something to build on for the Reds. But secondly... Um, and especially with the games coming up, Bournemouth, Leeds and so on. But then secondly, that um, actually if they can, there's something that they can, they, can, they can build upon. But also all teams in the bottom half of the table are keep, capable of beating each other, aren't they? So, you know, Southampton winning today. Everton look like they're in trouble. West Ham are free falling. Bournemouth aren't doing so good at the moment. So... Um, so what what do you think? How do you feel about about the way the table looks at the moment? Well, I mean, I think, um, and I said this uh, to Tom the other day: is Wolves under Lopetegu look a different proposition to earlier in the season. Um, but apart from that, the other teams below us, they're all struggling at the moment. Yeah, they're they're all on a downward curve, and it's just us and Wolves that are on an upward one. And maybe Southampton because okay it's maybe, one win in the yeah. league but that's after beating City in the cup as well yeah so they'll have a little bit of confidence now but and and I mean Steve Cooper always says it's one step at a time before the World Cup we were thinking actually this is that there's the beginnings of a decent team here and we're starting to work together and, and getting a bit of um a bit of a rhythm going mm. but we weren't seeing the fruits of that in the table it, it was just we were yeah. still rooted in the re relegation zone whereas now it's actually coming to, coming to fruition we're actually yeah. seeing some results from that and in that respect actually it is a bit of a throwback to championship football where actually if you just put two or three results together all of a sudden the table can look very very different mm. um so so these matches against Bournemouth and Leeds are important how important is it going to be so with Yates, we're not quite sure what it is, but the speculation is it's concussion. And if it is, he might not be available for Bournemouth. With Henderson, we don't know what it is. And I'm saying muscle injury. Yeah, and with the greatest of respect to Wayne Hennessy, he was signed to be a number two. Mm. And the, I, I think Wayne Hennessy, from what I've seen of him for us, he seems all right at shot stop, shot stopping, but he lacks a bit of concentration. And mm -hmm. if you're a keeper. Yeah. You need that concentration. So it wouldn't necessarily be that much of a surprise if one of the players Forrest looked to sign is, is, a, is a goalkeeper. Yeah. Um, obviously, we've got to think about squad size as well. This is going to be a subject of a whole other conversation. And towards the end of the month, we'll have a talk about the transfer window. Um, but the thing that's good is that Danilo is a young player, so he won't count towards the 25-man yeah, yeah. squad limit. Um, but yeah, it's that thing, isn't it? You, 
with a goalkeeper, if you're going to sign a goalkeeper, you kind of want to be signing someone experienced, don't you? Yeah, someone <laughs> and and someone who can as well. It's, it's the the match fitness thing doesn't count in the same way as it does for outfield players, but it does count in terms of their sharpness and how their, their concentration, which is the thing that's important. Yeah, and yeah, I I, I think we need one. Finding yeah, is like centre forward, so yeah, isn't it? Finding a good finding goalkeeper one is to yeah. do that, and also preferably one that's um, not cup tied. Yeah, absolutely true. Absolutely because true. That's the other thing that's actually that's actually a worry now. Is the Blackpool game showed the 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 depth of our squad, and not only do we have these three games, we've got through one of them that are very very important, followed by Manchester City who I think are actually beatable at the moment, Mm -hmm. as Man United proved, but we're not Man United. Um, But Southampton proved it as well. Uh, Having the two games with Man United sandwiched in the middle of that, when our squad has this injury crisis on, that's actually really bad timing. Yeah, we could do without the extra games, couldn't we? Mm. Um, So, yeah. And and, And I think that's why Johnson came came off as well, because I think he's not fully fit either. Mm. Yeah, um, and, and that's the thing, is that it, it's so often the case, isn't it? Because when you've got a few players who are out, it means the existing players have to play those extra minutes or maybe mm. play when they wouldn't otherwise have played. Um, I say, Scarp is a good example. We weren't expecting him to play three games in a row. Um, so so there is plenty to think about. I'm sure that uh, there'll be a few phone calls made to uh, Mr Maranakis to ask him to get the checkbook out. Um, we will be back after the Bournemouth match. So very interesting that although we've got the Man United games, the next two league games could be really pivotal pivotal for Forest season. And the fact that I can't say words anymore suggests it's a good time to leave this particular match report. So thank you very much to Baz and thank you for listening. And as I say, we'll be back in a week's time after the Bournemouth match. Podcast Network.